Hello, I'm Kimberly, and welcome to the weekend edition of the Native News Update. It's Friday, May 11th, and many of the stories you hear here can be found at IndianCountryNews.com. And here's the news for the day from the Associated Press and other Native News sources. The Navajo Code Talkers Association Vice President Samuel So passed away the evening of May 9th in Farmington, New Mexico from complications of cancer. Samuel was born June 22, 1922 at Black Mountain near Many Farms, Arizona. At the age of 17, Samuel enlisted into the United States Marine Corps by claiming he was 21 years old in order to be eligible for the military. He relocated to Camp Pendleton in Southern California where he learned to be a code talker. During World War II, the Marine Corps enlisted about 400 Native American code talkers who were trained to transmit messages built upon their native language. The United States military used the code talkers in the South Pacific to send encrypted messages which never were cracked by the Japanese advisories. Samuel loved sharing tales of the code talkers with his family and with audiences nationwide. One of his favorite stories was when Samuel had reached Iwo Jima, an island that hosted one of the most intense battles between American and Japanese troops. I think as a Navajo coat talker, I think uh, the coat itself was very important because they call us to run across Death Valley and locate the Japanese machine guns. We went and we locate where the Japanese machine guns were. And one of the coat talkers by the name of Ambrose Howard sent that message out to the headquarters where the targets were. And uh, before we knew it, artillery fires rocket fires, and motor fires, all at the same time, and knock out all those machine gun nests. If the Japanese knew that we send that message to their location, they would have abandoned their location and went back into the caves or tunnel. When they don't know what message was sent, they get caught by surprises. And that's where the Navajo coat talkers really help. In fact, the uh, signal officer of the 5th Marine Division uh, by the name of Major Howard Connors said, if it weren't for the Navajo coat talkers, the Marines would have never taken Iwo Jima. See, that's what really important was, and I didn't really realize it until after the war. Samuel returned from the war and went to college to pursue a career as a teacher. He obtained a bachelor's degree at Utah State University and a master's degree at Arizona State University before acting as an instructor and involved youth advocate on school boards and committees. Sharing the significance of the Navajo language became Samuel's mission up until his final days. His family hopes to honor his legacy by continuing his efforts to build the National Navajo Code Talkers Museum and Veterans Center to be constructed in Window Rock, Arizona. To help make donations to the Museum and Veterans Center, you can send it to the Navajo Code Talkers Association, Attention the Museum, P.O. Box 1266, Window Rock, Arizona, 86515. For the first time, a Native American tribe is bringing ancestral remains back to the U.S. for reburial. 
The seven remains of tribal members from the Salinine tribe in Central California, dating back hundreds of years, are now back in their homeland. The tribe worked with the University of Birmingham in the UK to bring the remains back home. It's believed that the remains were first stolen, sold to a private collection, and then donated to the university sometime in the 1800s. The tribe says this is the first time Native American remains from a museum or university collection are being returned to their homeland. According to a new legal analysis by the National Wildlife Federation and Ecojustice Canada, gaps, inconsistencies, and loopholes in the U.S. state and Canadian provincial laws are leaving the Great Lakes and other natural resources vulnerable to a new wave of mining activity sweeping Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the Canadian province of Ontario. The report examines whether state and provincial laws are up to the task of overseeing a type of mining new to the region that has proven to be devastating to natural resources in parts of the western United States and Canada. Sulfide mining regulation in the Great Lakes region also reviewed the role of tribal governments in the permitting process and found that jurisdictions failed to consider tribal perspectives and have denied meaningful tribal input into the decision making. This is despite the fact that tribal entities have substantial land holdings and treaty rights across the upper Great Lake region. Beyond identifying the flaws in sulfide mining permitting, regulation, and enforcement throughout the area, the National Wildlife Federation analysis also includes a series of recommendations, some with jurisdiction, specific implications, and others that apply throughout the region. To read the full report, you can go to nwf.org forward slash mining report. First Nations in British Columbia, Canada are demanding that salmon habitat be restored in the Lumbee area. Members of the Okanagan Nation released Chinook Fry in the Shuswap River above Wilsey Dam on May 10th. Grand Chief Stuart Phillips said this is one of the last remaining salmon fishing stations in the territory and they want to see the salmon and the habitat restored so they can enjoy a healthy fishery once again. Salmon have been unable to access about 30 kilometers of habitat since the dam was constructed 80 years ago. The Okanagan Nation Alliance wants a passage developed around the dam so the fish can access the upper area. The Potter Valley Tribe is in line to get 723 acres of former PG&E property along the Eel River in Mendocino County, California. The recommendation comes from the Stewardship Council during their May 2nd board meeting. The Potter Valley Tribe says it sees the acquisition of land along the Eel River as presenting an opportunity to own land within its ancestral range. It will also allow them to improve education and youth elder involvement through development of cultural resource educational facilities, vocational training as camping facilities are expanded, summer environmental camps for all ages of youth, and restoration of the fisheries through cooperation with interested entities. Also, the tribe says it would like to participate with other tribes and community youth programs interested in coordinating efforts to educate the broader community of the unique history and culture of their local Native American people. Three First Nation teens are in Toronto this weekend preparing for the final City TV's Canada's Got Talent. Vince Olaney and Brian and Dallas Cushane from Sakeen's First Nation danced their way into the finals which will be on May 13th. The group called Seguin's Finest put together a routine based on their traditional jigging. Their routine is fairly traditional, but they did add some fusion elements from other more modern dance styles. They had a big moment in their performance this past week that got them to the final round where they threw a moonwalk in the middle of their routine. You can learn more about this trio by checking them out on facebook.com forward slash Seguin's Finest. And that's another roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. I'd like to thank you for joining me and have a grand day.